Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Matchett from Campus Morning Mail and welcome to this CMM discussion with our partners Twig Marketing on the future for researchers. First up, I'm speaking from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. We're recording this session for the people, quite a lot of people, who can't be here live, but have asked us to be able to access it uh, over the next couple of days, few days. For all its disdain for universities, the previous government was keen on research, but selectively so. In September 2019, then Education Minister Dan Tien told a meeting of vice chancellors that he wanted universities and the industry to connect. If I can put a compelling case to my colleagues, and we are absolutely instrumental, that we are absolutely instrumental in driving productivity in this nation for the next decade, then I think we can get the support that we need to grow the sector. Uh, Minister, then Minister Tien said in September 2019. His case compelled, at least to the extent that the previous government announced a comprehensive research commercialization strategy last year with significant funding to make it happen. And while the new government is yet to declare its intentions, ministers do link research to jobs and growth when they talk. It appears to be part of a trend. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, overall spending on pure basic research dropped over $300 million between 2018 and 20. What the ABS refers to as strategic basic research increased from 2.16 billion to 2.24 billion. But apply, uh, applied research outlays, out, outlays, I'm sorry, grew by $824 million to 6.7 billion. There are two questions, however, that are ignored in the assumption that research that matters has a foreseeable future in the marketplace. One is what happens to the curiosity-driven research that does not set out to meet a market need, but may well in the future. And what is the future for research across all disciplines that pursues knowledge for its own sake and that disciplines that serve society, not economy? To discuss the future for pure research in pragmatic times, I'm joined by three people who are across both the policy and the lived experiences of researchers. Thank you all for being here. I know how busy you are. I appreciate you sparing the time. Rowena Barrett from QUT was supposed to be with us, but she's in far north Queensland today, and she only has exceedingly inadequate internet access. But John Byron, also from QUT, is as is scheduled as he is, as is. He's principal policy advisor at QUT with a long career in research policy and its interface with politics. Uh, he gave evidence on behalf of QUT to a Senate committee inquiry to a Greens bill on ARC independence last year, and it's a model in my humble opinion, of how to do it. He also made the case for the eternal relevance of the humanities last year in his novel, The Tribute, in which a detective relies on an art historian in a murder investigation. Catherine Colborn is Dean of Arts at the University of Newcastle and President of the Australasian Council of Deans of Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities. In March, Professor Colborn warned that the policies of the previous government represented a sustained assault on the DASH disciplines. And she welcomed the new Labor government, as well as crossbenchers and the Greens, saying, and I quote, the value of our disciplines can be seen in every part of Australian life. Without arts, humanities, and social science research, we would not be using languages to build peace and diplomacy in our region, or have our current social institutions forging democracy. We would have little shared conceptual knowledge of our nation's ancient histories, nor their indigenous cultures. Chunapati Jagadash joins us. He's a professor of electronic, uh, electronic materials engineering at ANU. And as far as I can understand, um, his comprehensive CV, he's also, uh, his work is also focused on quantum computing. He's also president of the new president of the Australian Academy of Science. On his appointment there earlier this year, he was quoted as saying of Australia, at the moment, we're a resource-based economy, and I'd like to see us move towards a knowledge-based economy, because that is where the opportunities are. We need to develop a national strategy to make this transition, he said. Thanks again to all of you. Mr. Colburn, let me start with you. The previous government did not disguise its disdain for humanities research. And does that reflect a fundamental problem in the broader community, a problem that exists even before questions of what is value for money in research come up? Yeah, look, thank you very much, Stephen, for the invitation to speak as part of this. And I would like to acknowledge that I'm here on Awabakul and Waramai lands in uh, Newcastle, and I'm here representing the Deans of Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities, as you've mentioned. 
Uh, look, I think that probably what's often been discussed is the idea that Australians have a, a difficult and sometimes strained relationship with higher education and with universities. And we tend to compare ourselves to a, a kind of Anglo-American model where, you know, potentially universities are more uh, deeply entrenched in slightly older societies or much older societies and have longer traditions. And so we're a newer, younger country when it comes to university cultures. And I think that what we're seeing or what, what we have seen in the, in the past decade or so is an amplification of that tension between the wider community and uh, universities and intellectual thinking and also the coalition, outgoing coalition or the former coalition government. And I think that we need to see this question you've raised, this topic through uh, a number of frames. And those frames are, as we've been hearing in the recent uh, past in, in uh, the Universities Australia conference in particular, are frames such as uh, the preoccupation with policy settings around commercialization of research, which was also the subject of this morning's session, the uh, outcomes of uh, the vetoes of HASS discovery projects at the ARC by the minister at the end of last year, and we've just touched on that as well. Uh, and I, I think also the concern around what it means to have a national interest test or what it means to define research as being in the national interest and an emerging discourse around universities as major centres for research and development and employability training, rather than as places for what we might term curiosity-driven research and learning. So I think all of those things, when you put them together, um, coupled with that uh, strained relationship that I think our wider community has with universities in a relatively young society, I think we, we do have a, a kind of confluence of things that, that mean we aren't really in, uh, I think, a kind of yet to mature conversation about what universities could and should offer in this country in terms of, uh, you know, training, education and blue sky thinking. Okay. Uh, Professor Jagadish, your work is immensely complex. Uh, so far, I, didn't, I don't understand a word of it. Um, but is it something that begins with an, a, a, an objective or is, it, or, or is it a lot of it just seeing where the research takes you? Oh, thanks, Stephen. And then most of the time we start off with the curiosity driven question of, uh, you, know, I mean, you know, can we really make something? Otherwise, can we really understand a particular phenomena which we are trying to understand? Then once we really understand the phenomena and then we then move towards uh, developing the you know, devices uh, with that understanding and then be able to apply those ones. So really my research covers a full spectrum from the very fundamental questions to apply and then uh, taking patents and then transferring some of the technology to industry as well. So the key point here is that uh, the basic science is absolutely critical for the future of the world and future of any country. And there are many examples I can give you. For example, we work on lasers. And uh, lasers and uh, the curiosity-driven research. And in fact, uh, in 1917, Einstein predicted you can make lasers to work. Until 1960, and we didn't, were not able to make these ones. In 1960, Ted Maimon from Hughes Research Laboratory has demonstrated the first laser. And even at that time, people didn't know what is the laser is useful for. But now you can see that in the modern world, we cannot live without lasers. Today's internet, we're able to communicate with you because we are sending the signals to optical fibers and that's all using lasers, for example. And you're talking about laser printing, lasers are used and uh, again for laser surgery. And I can give you many examples of you know, cutting and the machining and the range of things lasers are currently used. But at that time, nobody knew where the, uh, how these lasers are going to be useful but then people found applications for those ones. So that's why it is absolutely critical to really focus on curiosity-driven fundamental basic research, and then without knowing where these applications will find, then people will find those applications once you really solve some of the problems based on the curiosity-driven research. Okay. John Byron, are there examples of, of, of mm -hmm. nations that, that, that have bet the farm, as it were, on just applied research policy, just uh, developing the ideas of other, of other, uh, other researchers uh, in other countries? Uh, thanks, Stephen. And <clears throat> I'll just mention I'm coming to you from Turrbal and Yagara land in Brisbane today. <clears throat> um, and thanks also for the, uh, the cross-promotion of my novel, um, yeah. where I get to champion 
uh, humanities research. I've been a champion of humanities research and pure basic fundamental research actually my entire 25 years in this game. So it's always, you, you, you can never have enough channels to make your advocacy. Um, in answer to your question, I'm not aware, I mean, Tom Barlow is probably a better person to ask this question, but I'm not aware of anybody who said, uh, we give up on having our own ideas and we're just going to rip off everybody else's IP, um, which is another like less polite way of saying what you've said. Um, but I'm aware of some, um, some countries that are doing it in ways that are pretty instructive. So, for instance, um, you know, the Weizmann Institute in Israel, in uh, Tel Aviv, um, they had a, a very big early success in, in multiple sclerosis medication. Um, that was not, they did not sit around with a, a, a committee um, saying, okay, we need, to, we need to treat MS, how are we going to do that? Like, what they did was they had very talented business development people who would look over the shoulders of the very talented fundamental researchers who were just getting on with finding out how muscles work and, you know, the neuronal interactions with musculature. And the business people did what they did really well and the researchers did what they did really well. And the result is um, a, an absolute gold star commercialisation enterprise. But it's based on uh, fundamental research and letting the researchers just get on with it. Um, and, then, and then bringing in people that can say, can you do anything, can you make anything with this? And, and so that's where I think, you know, look, so 100 years ago, Niels Bohr had no idea that he was inventing the microwave oven and the CD player. Mm. Um, but that's, that's kind of what he was doing. And if, if his funding had depended on being able to predict those applications, we wouldn't, he wouldn't have done that work. I mean, if, that's, if that was what was required for that research to take place, wouldn't have happened. There isn't any application um, that isn't built ultimately on fundamental research. And, but it's risky, and that's why the public sector has to actually invest in it, because the private sector that needs shorter-term, more predictable returns in a more linear kind of way, which is not actually how big breakthroughs work, they're not going to take that punt. And it's understandable. They've, they've got responsibilities to stakeholders. We have to take that punt collectively as a community, in other words, um, through the, the mechanisms of government and public funding. And that's, that's actually the rationale for, um, in, in effect, I'm, I'm not, don't disagree that um, there's value in seeing, in exploring how universities can better commercialise things that are ready for application. But in fact, there, there's a much greater justification for public investment in pure basic fundamental research because of that risk factor. No one else is going to take that punch. No one else can. But in, given resources are always inadequate to the good purposes that they could be used for, um, government, government or an agency has to make some decisions. Sure, um, but they've got to think about, well, where do they expect the applied research ideas to be coming from in, you know, four or five or ten years' time if we haven't done the hard yards further upstream? Um, because people, the thing is that, you know, companies tend to take ideas and run with them that, uh, that arise in their environment, you know? And so, um, you know, we, we can't just say, well, we'll just sit back and wait for some genius in, in, at Caltech to do some fundamental research and then we'll apply it. Because Silicon Valley is going to apply that work, actually. It's the pe people that are clustered physically around those fundamental researchers that are going to get first bite at it. We are, we're going to miss out. We have to do it ourselves here. It's not like everybody puts their fundamental research into a pool and, and that's equally accessible to everybody else around the world to run with. We have to have some homegrown stuff here as well. And we've got the talent, you know, do we really want to discourage those, uh, those research careers, um, the best and brightest? We've got a lot of other reasons why people want to move to Australia, but if they can't make a career here, they will go to those other places and make contributions elsewhere. And we'll just be digging stuff out of the ground and shearing sheep for the rest of our lives, you know. Mm -hmm. A, a former chair of the ARC, who, um, who is not your bo former boss, John, or your present boss, John, um, once, said present boss, yeah. once said to me that um, they were always puzzled um, by the populist scoffing at some ARC grants, generally in the humanities. Uh, but it, they, they said that politicians tended to do that because they weren't smart enough to understand the equally obscure and unapplied maths, maths research proposals that got up. Um, what does it say, Professor Colborn, about us that we, that we do appear to take great pleasure in taking pot shots at the, at, at the humanities, even more so than the social sciences? 
Yeah, look, it's a question I often get asked in, in my role whenever I'm invited to speak on radio about things. And there's a sense that it's sort of fun to talk about as well, you know. So I appreciate the question, though, because there's a deeper, more serious vein in there, which is that I think people are nervous of, of critical ideas often. Uh, and, you know, I, I probably share the idea that we should have... Um, you know, be able to explain our research in the humanities in particular, and we should be able to articulate why it should be funded by public money. I think that's entirely appropriate. And often the onus is then put on to humanities researchers to do a better job of that. I think it is somewhat easier in the social sciences to, uh, you know, explain uh, the application of ideas, you know, particularly from um, sociology, from economics, from those sorts of fields. They're much more kind of practically kind of oriented, whereas the humanities can seem quite obscure to people who may not be entranced by literary studies. Uh, I think history, my own discipline, is much easier for many people to digest and understand. But I think it, it really is on us to explain those kinds of outcomes. And, you know, I was going to go on to say as well that there are many examples of discoveries in the humanities, which over many centuries, which have actually led to then scientific and technological breakthroughs. So I think the kind of combination of those things, the pairing of our insights with other insights that might be then further down the track seen as applicable in computing or, or whatever it might be, um, also needs to be better and more widely known. But the taking of pot shots is, is really, I think, about a social and cultural unease and discomfort with an intellectual culture and with public intellectuals in Australia. I, I mean, I really do think that. Mm. Yeah. I take your point. I mean, John Locke wasn't, wasn't, an, wasn't an engineer. Um, but so how do you address that? I mean, it, it, it is, you mentioned history. I don't think it's a golden age for undergraduate history enrollments at the moment. Um, how, how do disciplines actually get on the front foot and exp explain not their relevance, but their importance? I think that the Learned Academy, so the Academy of uh, Humanities, the Australian Academy of Humanities and the uh, Australian um, Social Sciences Academy have done a really good job of this. If you take a look, and I'm sure you will have, at how they promote the research and the researchers uh, in this country, the, the really top uh, researchers and, and, of course, all the other researchers in universities who are doing great work, you'll see that it's been a major exercise in the last five to ten years in communication and really focusing on how to articulate those wins and gains for the disciplines. Uh, the, in, at the end of 2019, um, the Humanities Academy released 50 stories, communication stories about uh, breakthroughs, discoveries and ideas creation in the humanities. The social sciences uh, articulates the many, many thousands of people involved in the public and private sectors in Australia who have social science training without whom the country would, you know, really not run and tick as it does. So I think there's plenty of really good work going on out there. Um, again, I think this is a, it's a bit of a mystery in some respects, and we might have other theories about it. It comes down to the relative value placed on degrees in universities and the steady uh, but sure movement of universities towards um, the identity as training institutions for employable uh, graduates, which I think is also appropriate. However, what gets lost in there is the fact that there's um, a missing understanding of the value, the broad-based value of general degrees in science, but also in the humanities that can lead to marvellous employment outcomes. They're just more diffuse and diverse than vocational settings would suggest. Hmm. Professor Jagadish, um, do ministers understand, or uh, ministers and senior public servants understand that the, just the core fundamental importance of, of giving, letting people in the lab get on with it? Uh, to, to some extent, uh, Stephen, and uh, so, but at the same time, as been pointed out by John and Catherine, and we have a lot of work to do to be able to convince the public and as well as the policymakers the importance of investment into long-term fundamental research. As uh, you know, only governments can provide, as John pointed out, that the patient capital. In fact, in the 90s, the CEOs of the American companies have gone and advised the Congress, you don't worry about the commercial aspects of the research, and you know, we can deal with that one because we can immediately see the benefit of uh, investing in the commercial research in the short term, but we want you to invest in the long-term basic research, and that's where the ideas come, that's where the pipeline of ideas will be, the ones which will be feeding into Commercial, commercialization of ideas or so. So that's where I think there's more work need to be done. Again, uh, 
you know, science academies uh, and as well as the has academies uh, work very hard to really convince the policymakers the importance of investment in long-term research, but we all have a lot of work to do in order to be able to really convince the policymakers really long-term investment is an important one for the future of the country. Hmm. How would you do it, John? If you were given if you were given the brief by a minister, how would you do it? Well, it, it, um, I think what Catherine mentioned earlier, the storytelling side of it, you know, the stuff that the Academy of Humanities did, stories are where it's at, right? Um, so <clears throat> it's it's both the public domain, but it's also in the minds of the politicians and the policymakers. Is that um, obviously numbers are important. They need to know that um, budgets and so on stack up, and they do their due diligence with that. But it's always when someone tells a story is when you see the light bulb go off over someone's head and they finally get it. It could be a case study. It could be a patient with a certain disease that describes how a treatment has helped them a path back to, to normality in their daily life, or whatever, but, but it's always about stories. And we have so many great stories in this country uh, out of our research. I mean. When I, when I was working in Kim Carr's office um, in, in the last Labor government, um, you know, I, I was the uh, senior advisor on science and research, um, which is um, just quietly the best job in the country. Because um, I got to go around and meet, well, I mean, this is far from the only thing I did, but one of the things I got to do is go around and meet all of the amazing researchers right across the country that do just incredible work and mind-blowing stuff that they take for granted because it's their day daily life and you know it's almost like you know someone mentions oh yeah last week we cured polio but this week we're working on malaria it's like wait 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 I'm interested in malaria but back up a bit what polio you know like this just not a literal example but stuff like that it was just mind-blowing and and part of my job was to turn that into um into good news stories not in a not in a journalistic way because that there that takes place and this is I'm talking about in parallel with that it's in a in a way of trying to convince people about to normalize the idea that um, university research is um, is part of living in a vibrant, um, productive, um, you know, advanced economy and society. And so you can't really you can't open a newspaper any day of the week without their reference in the first few pages somewhere to expertise in a university. And it, we always forget. We think that universities are off in their ivory towers. That has never been experienced in Australia in my like the time time I've been involved in universities. Um, and if it ever did exist, it's long in the past and good, it should be because we are engaged. We've got, we have open, we're open to our communities around us. We don't have gates and walls um, and, and it's that continuity with our communities actually daily life in universities. But a lot of people don't realise that. We need to be a bit better at telling those stories. But the other thing is, um, you know, to, to refer, just to quickly, just to refer back to your statement um, about, about a minister saying, I've got to convince the colleagues. You know, I was working for Kim when he convinced the colleagues to fund the Square Kilometre Array project, right, which is very expensive and it's an international collaboration. It's fairly speculative in some ways, uh, really interesting radio astronomy. Um, and like the humanities, the immediate application of that or so-called relevance of that research to the daily life of ordinary Australian taxpayers is not obvious. He made that case successfully um, and, and we are committed to the SKA and I'm really glad we are. It's a fantastic project. I'm, I've got a little bit of a you know, private passion for radio astronomy, so I was quite pleased to help with that. But it can be done, actually. Um, it's, not, it's not just a question of just give me the easy stuff and I'll get you the funding and the, and the hard stuff will have to take its chances. Actually, no. This, it's a lot more expensive to fund radio astronomy than it is a bunch of you know literary theorists or historians um, but nobody seems to actually have a big problem with us doing particle physics research or radio astronomy or whatever where where the outcomes are a little um, that, that are equally um, you know distant from market application but at some point um, we've got to decide that that we're interested in what it is to be human what it is to be Australian what it is to live um, as a large island off the coast of Asia uh, what it is to live in a democracy that interacts with more authoritarian political structures, they're all humanities questions. And, and if we stop doing those kinds of things, effectively we're saying, you know, the, the big um, Huntingtonian, uh, you know, clash of civilizations argument right now that's going on is, is kind of between, you know, communist China and the, the democratic West. Well, that's a humanities discussion. 
you know, and all of, all of the, the hard thinking, are we, are we really willing to say that we stopped having to do the thinking about that in the 19th century and there will be no more thinking about what those categories mean and how they might evolve or interact with each other. And so I think it's more critical right now, based on every story on the front page of the newspaper, that we continue to invest in the full range of thinking. That's part of it's about research, but part of it's about teaching and learning in classrooms as well. Brother, I think you might have just nailed the whole problem when you kept referring to newspapers. You might have trouble explaining to anybody under 30 what they actually are, <laughs> but, but, but never mind. Looking and, 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 and fair go to the coalition, um, you've got the SKA, but you've also got the dark matter, uh, the, dark, the, the dark matter research at Stall, where I think with Dan T and funded yes. a bunch I, of I, I know it. I know it very well. There were sentences in the media release um, that I wrote, actually. That, <laughs> that came to us as a brief a very long time ago Gosh, because time the gold ago. price went down far enough for that, that gold mine to become available as a, um, a very highly filtered um, neutrino detection um, exercise. And, uh, and it, unfortunately, we couldn't get that funded alongside SKA. I wish. It was, it's a real... Really great well, project. It, it's certainly happening them. now. I, had an, an I asked an yeah. official to try to explain it to me, which they duly did very, very slowly. And uh, frankly, I just sort of nodded politely. I'll, I'll, I'll send you an undergraduate essay I wrote on, uh, on the, dis the debate between machos and wimps, which is the big, um, what is the nature of dark matter? So You, you raised a point that, that, that I think is very interesting, just to extend on it to Catherine Colborne. It seems to me that in the last decade or so, Australia has changed profoundly in the way it engages with Indigenous Australians. Um, the, the, the Indigenous flag will now fly on the Sydney Harbour Bridge next to the national one. Uh, it's, it, it is somebody of my age, it's something that would not have happened um, a generation ago. And I suspect a great deal of that is due to, is due to the pioneering work of as historians, I mean, obviously Henry Reynolds is the name that comes to mind, but many, many others, and just a cultural change embedded in the humanities uh, that pointed pointed at injustice. And over time, it has been, it, it has changed the way we look as, as a nation. I think it's just quite profound. Uh, and I think it's because it's happened slowly and carefully, and indeed there is a great deal of work still to be done. Um, nevertheless, we are a far more tolerant accepting, uh, honouring society than we were when I was a boy. Yeah, look, I've been thinking about that a lot recently because we we had our 20th anniversary and we had our guest speaker was Adam Shoemaker. When you say we? Uh, uh, 20th anniversary of Dash. Oh, yeah. Yeah, our birthday uh, last week we celebrated. We invited the uh, Vice-Chancellor of Victoria University, Adam Shoemaker, to speak at our event and of course, he specialises in Indigenous literature and, and languages. Uh, that was his background. And he made this point too, that if, in fact, uh, Hass researchers could be um, partly credited with, I think, uh, you know, this kind of shift that you're mentioning. Of course, we should also attribute a lot, um, most of, of this change to Aboriginal activism, oh, yes, course, engagement yeah. and so on. But I think in terms of creating knowledge, I think the other thing, the other point I would make about Australia is that we're still coming to grips with understanding Indigenous knowledges, First Nations research, the original researchers, uh, you know, everything from controlling the natural environment to where we should and shouldn't build homes, you know, given the, the recent flood crises in Australia. So I think we've got a long way to go there in terms of understanding, you know, the, the real knowledge making in a, in a society like ours. Uh, but I think you're right. I think opening up those questions of history, anthropology, social justice, uh, law could be put into this too in terms of legal advocacy for Indigenous peoples. That whole array of questions has, um, you know, broadly falls under the umbrella of the humanities and social science discipline. So I think we could say that there's a maturing process there. Um, going back to my earlier comment about maturity, uh, I wanted to come back to something John said, though, about um, Australian life and culture and kind of knowing ourselves and knowing who we are. Uh, in the last couple of years, the Australian Research Council ran a strategic research initiative round to focus entirely on Australian national interest research because I think they wanted to, um, you know, put the call out to researchers of Australian life and culture and the natural world to say here is a particular pot of research funding that you can contest. 
And it was overwhelmed with applications. I think over 800 applications to that fund. I applied myself. Many researchers applied for two and three projects in teams or individual projects. There was more flexibility in the type of grant you could apply for in terms of the amount of funding. And I think that really shows us that there are plenty of very strong ideas out there in terms of what researchers would like to be doing. Obviously, they couldn't all be funded. That's understandable. But I think perhaps if we delved more deeply into the array of applications that went to that strategic research round, uh, it could be quite instructive in terms of the kind of depth of research that's going on inside universities. And the other point I'd like to make is that with the sort of context we're in in higher education policy settings, universities tend to follow uh, the kind of indicators that are being set at a national level by, by policy, by government. And that means that internally, attitudes towards certain disciplines and certain disciplinary practices and research tend to follow. So what we've witnessed at a, at a sort of national level, but also internally inside many universities, is I think a steady diminution of the value of humanities research, which worries me as a humanities researcher and a social scientist, but also for the future, because it will mean that some of our best and brightest researchers don't stay or don't enter the profession. And I think that's of great concern to us. I imagine you could have that almost same conversation, though, in, in, in a science faculty um, uh, a seminar room, Professor uh, Jagadish. Do we as a culture respect science? Well, partly, but uh, there's more work need to be done, uh, Stephen. And uh, so certainly some people, those who understand science and uh, so they appreciate the value of science, but I think science literacy is an important one. I think that need to start at the primary school level and the secondary school level and then the Academy of Science has got uh, programs like uh, primary connections and science by doing. And uh, again, HC, uh, the Technological Academy also has got programs. So really all of us need to work together to really create a scientifically literate population, even if they don't really take science as a career, but if you're really dealing with the societal problems like complex problems, like whether it's a pandemic or otherwise climate change, and people need to be able to really understand evidence-based information and critically be able to think. And if somebody posts something on the social media, does it make sense or not? You know, that's where the scientific thinking really becomes an important one. So that's why we really need to start from the schools and uh, thereby people understand the importance of science and also the role science can play in society. And also scientific thinking can help them in their own career and their life as well. The, the, the same, uh, stepping aside from debates over vaccines, uh, it strikes me that there has been an enormous trust, it, it, I don't think people, people wouldn't express it as in scientific method, but that's what it is, uh, right across the board in, vast, in all sorts of disciplines in the last two years. Um, should we not be looking towards, towards this to build on it, to be something of a golden age for science? Absolutely. And uh, so, Stephen, that, so that's again, you see, the, in, we are able to address the pandemic issue because of the fact that there's a huge amounts of fundamental research took place in the molecular biology and virology. And that is information which has been really gained over 30 plus years. We were able to make use of in order to be able to really produce a vaccine within 18 months, which has never been unheard of in the past. For example. Yeah. That's because we have understood about the RNA and we understood about DNA and then how mRNA works and how we can manipulate that one in order to be able to create the vaccines or so. I agree with you that that's where, again, you know, as a population, we really start understanding and appreciating science is, it has an important role to play in terms of addressing the societal issues. And uh, so then, I mean, again, climate change is an issue that's, again, a polarizing issue. And then uh, now the pandemic, we're able to really, community has accepted science has an important role to play. And then can we really address the climate change, which we are already seeing impact of it in terms of, uh, you know, you know uh, having floods so often and bushfires and other things. And in, in our country, we are seeing the impact. Actually, we, our country is an experiment for climate change, and we're really suffering from that sort of thing. And so that's why there's a need for, in, you know, community coming together. And when I talk about science and also has community is also an important one because of the fact that they are very good in terms of engaging with the society and be able to really understand how the society works. And so really the has community, STEM community need to work together in order to address the social, social problems like pandemics and then the climate change. 
It's a, it's a really good point. I mean, um, as with the, the, the rights and respect owed to Indigenous Australians, uh, climate change appears to me to be an argument that is, if not one, that there would certainly be an emerging consensus that it is happening and we do have to do something about it in Australia. And that's what comes from 20 years of, con of science constantly making that case. Is that right, John? Yeah, I, I think so. But I also think that people have... Um that people incorporate a trust in the, in the scientific method, if, if you want to call it that, but I think similar, very similar methodological, um, disciplined, uh, strict, sceptical, evidence-based approaches are actually what define research across the board. Um, you know, in humanities and social sciences have, have their equivalents. It's not just a bunch of people's opinions. Um, but let's just talk about the scientific method for a second. I think people actually trust it more than they realise, for instance. So um, I was in a meeting once in, um, back in that job in, in Parliament House and somebody was playing the, the you know, um, devil's advocate and was saying, oh, well, you know, I don't actually take any of the stuff for granted that you science people spruik uh, at all. And I'm like, oh, yeah, how'd you get here? Blokes from Perth, right? I flew. I said, really? So that thing sitting there on the runway weighing 200 tonnes empty you're just going to get in that and go hurtling down a runway at hundreds of kilometres an hour without having some faith that somebody had a methodological approach that figured out how to do that safely you know and the guy's like damn that's a really good argument you know <laughs> so you know heavier than air flight to the naked eye is patently absurd, you know, and for most of human history, nobody really imagined it could be done except for Jules Verne and a couple of people that got locked up in a loony bin somewhere, you know, and then suddenly turns out some people took a more methodical engineering approach, did some experiments, and here we are, you know, and uh, there's an awful lot of daily life that's like that. I mean, you know, my iPhone doesn't work by magic, you know, nobody, I don't reckon, thinks it does. I think most people think, Someone's done some work that they don't understand, that I need to understand, um, that it's that it works in a reliable and predictable way because people have done the heavy lifting. You know, and, and just a little advertisement for pure basic research there as well. You know, Apple puts this thing together uh, at the end of, a, of a, a century of brilliant innovations in a million different components. You know, and so I, I think people actually are more accepting of of what science can deliver. Um, than, than they even think they are, and certainly more than the public discourse has. I don't reckon there's as much, um, you know, reluctance or resistance to expertise out there in reality as is being advertised. Well, that, that invokes the first law of Star Trek, uh, that people will assume we have technologies we haven't, can't even imagine that defy the laws of physics because I've seen them on television and they're just pop, part of popular culture. I thought the first laws of, of Star Trek was that you're allowed to split um, infinitives but anyway um, yeah you might be right um, but, I, but you're making an advertisement for my discipline of English literature is that very often um, the big ideas come in fiction first and um, William Gibson is an excellent example yeah. of that um, but equally you know I, I remember in the was it the 2006 Australia Day address that that um, John Howard, or somewhere back there anyway, that John Howard gave as Prime Minister um, in the Great Hall in Parliament, and he was he got stuck into humanities departments, so he called them, um, arts faculties is what he was talking about, and uh, on the basis of um, postmodern relativism. And my great regret that there was no journalist in the room who got up and said, oh, well, you're obviously much better read than the rest of us, Prime Minister. Can you tell us what postmodernism is? Because <laughs> he didn't know what postmodernism is. He's... he's He's critiquing a straw man. But one of the things postmodernism, among other things, was, was not a manifesto. It was a diagnosis or a prognosis. And the prognosis included things like the distribution of fake news, the rise of, um, of demagogues, um, the fracturing of um, authoritative sources of knowledge. You know, all the stuff that we see happening right now in our culture was predicted in the 80s by people saying this is actually where our culture is heading and that's actually what postmodernism is like this is what we've got to live with you know whether it was a warning or a celebration mm -hmm. is a whole other question but you know so it's just like science you know a lot of these ideas come first from people thinking big you know Einstein saying 
that you know you can actually use lasers you know um you know that this kind of thing where it's it's an idea it's a it's you know it's a mind experiment or it's a it's a plot for a novel or it's a philosopher thinking large and then other people think well actually maybe we can do this really you know? We need to go into subcommittee at a later stage on this because I mean th th this is not new what you discuss. You look at them, you look at the evolution of them of. Uh, liberalism in the 18th century. It was yeah. divisive and driven by the same sorts of arguments. Um, yeah. and the metaphors were different, but the core issues were the same. So how is it necessary to campaign or do or, or is it just just important to influence over time? Well, I think I think you kind of do both, um, you know, and they're on two timescales. I mean, this year's budget does matter, but um, but the longer the decadal budget is is the more important one in reality. Um, mm -hmm. But you can't sort of let go of the need to do a case by case thing. Campaigning but at the same time, um, campaigning. Is do, campaigning is hard to do subtly. Um, you, you could argue you could argue that some of the issues the humanities have faced in the, with the previous government were largely because um, people with uh, people with powerful positions were strident. Not suggesting they shouldn't be, but it, but it involves risks. It's true, and and some of that stridency is opportunistic. I mean, some of those people don't actually care about um, in themselves about the issues. They're using it as an opportunity to you know engage in a culture war or. or wedge the opposition or whatever you know um, but I remember having a discussion when I was executive director of the Academy of the Humanities and Brendan Nelson was the minister um, you know had a good relationship with with Brendan but he did veto a few ARC grants and we took pretty strong exception to that and I might add that we had very strong support from the other academies at the time which was much much appreciated because we are kind of all in this together actually and, um, you know, he said to me, look, the problem is, how do I look a carpenter in, in Penrith in the eye and tell him I'm spending his tax dollars on, you know, Renaissance art history or something, you know? And I said to him, well, it's, I can see why you, that, that question arises, but let me put it to you another way. How can you look that carpenter in the eye and tell him that his child who's interested in Renaissance art history does not get to pursue that interest professionally when the kids in your electorate of Bradfield can, because they come from families who can afford to, to pay for that when the government decides not to. You know what? Right. Who's going to decide that, that only rich people get to investigate things that they're passionate about? Which raises a really interesting question for the other, uh, for Professor Jagadish and um, Professor Colburn. Um, we are an infinitely more educated society than we were when I was a boy. I can remember in the 90s when the goal was to get 80, 90% of kids doing the HSC. Uh, and yet Bradley Bradley, um, Bradley did not de deliver uh, for the low SES, particularly regional and rural, but across the board, the, the, Bradley, uh, the Bradley report goals were made. We've got 40% of kids, uh, of post -school in, uh, young people in post-school education and training. Are we now more open open to ideas? Are we, are, are we now more tolerant of divergence than we, that, that, than we were? And is, it, and, and is this a potential for the sciences, for the humanities, for a love of learning? It, it, it is absolutely critical that um, I mean, we have to teach our kids the importance of love of learning. Learning is a lifelong process and then we really need to encourage that. Too. And uh, so the question now is that uh, are, are we really changing from lack of love of learning to the learning. And uh, so, but it's, uh, but the key issue is that people have realized as in the society that the, their parents have realized, kids have realized, unless otherwise they can get a higher education, it is very difficult to get find jobs and then be able to really get a good quality of life. And that's what is driving the people to go and then pursuing higher degrees or so, whether it's a vet degree, vet, vet courses or otherwise are the university degrees. That's a good thing, you know, and we, there's a lot of evidence out there that, uh, you know, educated population contribute to the economy much better and then contribute to the society much better. And uh, so the, uh, that's, uh, we should certainly encourage that, uh, that love for learning and also, you know, gaining new skills. And because of the fact that the society keeps on changing and then the learning is the only way we can really adopt to the change which is happening in the society and then learning new skills becomes an important thing because of the fact that the new technologies are coming, for example, artificial intelligence and new technologies are coming. So that means we need to keep on learning. Learning is an important thing for life. That's what I tell my students at least.
do you, do you distinguish in that learning from training? I mean, the tra training itself is, uh, I mean, yes, the, the training, we don't have to differentiate between the learning and training, and training itself is a, a good thing. And they see everybody doesn't have to go to university. If people want to go to university, we should encourage them. At the same time, somebody wants to pursue a technical skill, that's perfectly all right, because in the society, we need all, all skill bases in order to be able to function as a society. Yeah, I agree with that. And I went to university in the middle of the 1980s, Stephen. That's when I was an undergraduate. I grew up in regional Victoria in Australia, and uh, I went to the city for university. Uh, I was um, actually, you know, very privileged. I come from a, a background of academics and educators in general, so I'm probably, you know, in that in that sense, I've lived and breathed universities for a bit longer than some people. I think universities have been through a lot of changes since then, though, in terms of shifts in policy settings and capping of students and fees and all sorts of things. I mean, HEX was introduced when I was uh, an honours student or a master's student, I think, and you know, thinking about further study. So we've seen a lot of change that um, impacts the outcomes of, of all of that massification of education and the opening up of of bigger audiences to higher education. I, I don't think that um, it's, I don't think it's quite so simple and neat to say that we've really democratised education, higher education. Um, I think probably what concerns me is that um, we're seeing a trend now where humanities is, is becoming more and more the province of a more elite audience. Um, regional universities and the one I work in now, we're hit differently by um, the changes with job ready graduates and even smaller institutions in regional Australia are starting to, and I know this from very recent conversation with somebody, I won't, I won't talk about which institution, but are pausing their arts degrees or deciding not to go ahead with some plans for redeveloping arts degrees. So I'm a little bit more cautious about the, the sort of positivity. Um, however, I do think that what we're seeing instead is what I personally like to see is a bit more multidisciplinary learning. And I'd like to see um, some of the divisions between the putative disciplines really challenged and for degrees to be much more kind of uh, broad and uh, broad based so that we can then allow people to specialize for that lifelong learning going forward. So that would be my kind of wish on my wish list, really. Mm -hmm. If I can just, on, sorry. just jump, jump in and add something. Um, I, I agree with that, and particularly the multidisciplinary, like our, our enough familiarity with the way other people think that you can work with them in teams at a minimum, I think is really important. Um, but I'd also add, you know, that there are a couple of problems with the job ready graduates package, which I'm not a fan of, as you probably know. And, um, you know, one of them is this um, quite, in my opinion, quite flawed and doomed attempt to channel people into certain degrees using price signals that they get to ignore because of hex. I mean, it's kind of crazy by their own accounting, it doesn't actually work. But it's sort of, it's a pretty fraught um, intention in the first place. I mean, people do best at the things that they're passionate about. And, you know, at, our workforce is better off with people who've studied things that they really care about. Because not only will they learn the content, they'll also learn the method. And, and the styles of thinking and the, the critical thinking and the capacity to scrutinise with a healthy scepticism, uh, alleged conclusions from data to how reliable is the data in the first place, all those kinds of things that, it, that it's not that the content doesn't matter, but it doesn't probably matter as much when you're an undergraduate as those kinds of how to think, how to learn, how to keep learning uh, and how to read critically um, in your field or in, in in related fields that's actually the more important stuff and people do that better when they're studying something that they're really passionate about but the other thing that job ready graduates did that hasn't really been much talk about is that it pretty much broke the research teaching nexus and i wanted to bring back you know we're supposed to be talking about research in this session but i wanted to bring back that connection to the teaching and learning um, side of things where one of the distinguishing features about universities is that as a student you get exposed to the people who are at the cutting edge of your field. And not everybody's the same. You know, not everyone is a, you know, a top flight professor. Um, some people are on their way to become one and some people are uh, just, you know, they're, they're pretty good scholars and they're excellent school classroom teachers and that's terrific, but they are still at the cutting edge and they're still conducting their own research and pushing back the boundaries of knowledge. And that's who you're taught by. That's actually what a university is. And we made a decision in the eighties to 
um, to, be, to create a unified national system. And a lot of people said at the time that one of the risks is that we all become polytechnic, we all become universities. And I, I fear that we're always uh, at risk of backsliding on that. And, and I think the JRG's decision to effectively take out that extra funding for the students to enable their teachers to do at even just the scholarship of keeping up with the, the advances in their field, let alone doing their own research to contribute to that. I think that is dangerous and, um, and very short-sighted and needs to be addressed by the, the new government. Yeah, I think that's so true. And, and something I was hoping to add into this session again about that nexus, that relationship, is that when we revamped our Bachelor of Arts degree, we introduced a, a curiosity-driven or an inquiry-based learning approach so that we don't necessarily just deliver lots of, um, you know, kind of who are the key intellectuals in the humanities type lectures, but we get students to ask questions from, you know, the start of the semester, from the very beginning of, of the foundational core course in the BA. And we carry that through so that there's an emphasis on curiosity driven learning as well, which pairs with research led teaching. So I think that you're absolutely right about that. Tell me, um, Professor Jagadish, at ANU, I can't imagine you'll have any problems at ANU, but um, in general, is there, a, uh, is there a sufficiently strong cohort of young scientific researchers waiting in the wings to fill, fill your shoes? Uh, oh, thanks, Stephen. But the challenge for all the universities has been, particularly with the COVID hitting all the universities, and the international income has, has an impact. And then every university lost 400 to 500 people including my own university, we lost 450 people or so. And in physics, we lost 10 tenured staff and 17 professional staff, for example. So really, I mean, the, the, these issues of these funding issues have had a huge impact in terms of, uh, you know, as uh, John pointed out, that you know, science and engineering cost much more than humanities and social sciences, unless otherwise we properly fund them. And then we're expecting the universities to rely on international student income and we are doomed to fail. And in fact, there's not a really good position to be in, and we will need to properly fund R&D. In fact, last decade or so, we have gone down from 2.25% of the, uh, uh, the uh, GDP to 1.79, and uh, during the last decade, and then there's a need for to really change that and to move towards the positive slope, the negative slope of funding, uh, and properly funding the universities so that they'll be able to continue to do research. So the major frustration for me is that not been able to provide a sense of hope for the younger generation. The problem is that there are not many positions available in the university sector, and then they are on one scholarship or the other, or one fellowship or the other, and then uh, there's a ch chance that these people will be, you know, will be going overseas because of the fact that we are not really providing the right opportunities for them in Australia. So that's why universities need to be properly funded and research need to be properly funded. Again, the cost of research, you know, is, uh, you know, it's been government has discussed about this. In fact, probably Kim Carr's time as science minister or so. And uh, so the, you know, fully funding research, for example, UK has gone towards a full funding of research. A particular project has been funded and then everything has been costed and fully funded. So that really reduces the pressure on the university sector in terms of how to do the cross subsidization of the taking money from the teaching part of it and be able to really put money into the R&D. And particularly the government investment has gone down and that's where in fact, if you go and look at the R&D investments and it's the university sector which has enhanced the research investment because of the fact that this cost of subsidization process. So that's why there's a lot of work need to be done. And I think government has an important role to play in terms of investing properly in the university sector and then also creating opportunities for the next generation. And if we don't create opportunities for the next generation, we'll be losing their skills and abilities and then we're going backwards rather than forwards. And if you really move towards the knowledge-based economy, we do need these people. We need to really create opportunities for them. And they are passionate about what they're doing. And uh, they're really going to make the difference to the future of our country, and its economy and its uh, society as a whole. The work of ECOLA aside, do the broad discipline groups talk to each other enough? I can remember a couple of years ago, I think it was an argument over NCRIS funding where the social scientists got terribly worked up uh, about being excluded from, you know, basically from any access to the vast computing power. Uh, I can imagine there'd be a lot of your researchers, Catherine Colborn, who would love a quantum computer. I mean, the amount of data they could crunch in would be fantastic. But are you all talking enough to each other? Is there a, is there a grand alliance or need for one? Yes, I, look, I think so. The Academy of Humanities has held a couple of uh, summits uh, or forums for all the interested 
bodies and, and partners to to come along and talk and I've, I've been part of a couple of those COVID's of course been a little bit uh, destructive all around in terms of relationships but uh, paradoxically there have been a lot of online engagements as well so I do think there are a lot of um, united conversations across to our science colleagues um, as president of DASH I've actually been really overwhelmed by the number of um, presidents of similar organisations cross-cutting across all the disciplines who've reached out to try and have conversations. So that's been really heartening. So business, law, science, um, built environment, all kinds of deans, organisations. So I think we are talking, but the, the bigger question is, uh, yeah, how can we be a united lobby on certain issues? And there are, you know, many other university groups too. There's ATN, of course, and there's um, innovative universities, there's regional mm -hmm. universities. So how can we all be speaking the same language around things that impact this particular question, I suppose? Uh, and then a subset of that would be to, to kind of support each other when policy settings are moving in directions which affect some of us differently to others. So I think that's the challenge for the higher education sector. Jagadish? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with uh, Catherine completely because STEM and has need to work together and all the university sector also instead of dividing ourselves and then only looking at our own side of things, you know, really collectively working is the only way we can be able to convince the public and, and the government to invest in university sector and in the research and development areas. You know, it's really important. To, the minute we divide ourselves and uh, really try to only focus on our own discipline, that means we collectively are losing as a country and I think working together is an absolutely critical thing. And in fact, I have always participated in some of these HASTEM discussions in Deakin University and other places, which is sort of Humanities Academy organized. And I always said that STEM and HAST need to work together and the entire university sector and in the research institutions also, there are a lot of medical research institutes and others where we need to work together. If we want to really continue to move towards knowledge-based economy, we need to invest more. And then particularly the governments need to invest more so that we can be able to really flourish and then transition gradually from the resource-based economy to the knowledge-based economy. I wonder whether we need, in addition to a chief scientist, an overarching, for want of a better term, chief scholar, someone, who's, someone who speaks for, the, uh, for, the, for the, the great liberal tradition of learning and love thereof. You want the job, John Bowen? Uh, uh, well, you know, that, that topic has arisen many, many times. Um, and look, it, it's probably, it, it's always ended up, there's a bit of a football gets kicked around and it's probably not that helpful, actually. I, I think it's actually all right for there to be a chief scientist. Um, if the chief scientist and, you know, the current chief scientist I know pretty well and, and she's got a good grasp of what other research fields do and, and their value, if that person's willing to make those uh, arguments on behalf of the whole research community, I mean, you know, my old boss when I was in the business used to define science in as a Latin word rather than an English word, if you like. You know, that it's it's about all of it's systematic knowledge, you know, and it doesn't discriminate whether it's natural, physical, social, cultural, human, whatever. Um, you know, so I think I think you can make the argument without having to create a new office and you can know, appoint a new anoint a new job. It's really about who's who's responsible for that advocacy in government taking a broad view. That's probably the more productive way forward but equally while we're talking about working well together I think it's really good to try for us to push past this being a partisan debate um, you know one of the great uh, I'm going to give a lot of credit here to John Howard everybody says this uh, gun amnesty was a terrific contribution and it was um, but people always forget back in Australia's ability which was a Howard government initiative and it was a very long-term research infrastructure funding initiative and in many respects it continues um, in an in increase um, it's much smaller than it was, but BAA and BAA2, um, you know, was had bipartisan support and was funded um, by Labor when it came into government as well. And, and that's actually, this is a long game we're in. It's not just a global business. It's also a long business in, in temporal terms. And it, it outlasts governments. It certainly outlasts parliaments and forward estimates periods. And so... We really do need to recruit people on both sides of the aisle and the crossbenchers for that matter. And so it's about trying to depoliticise this stuff and, and get people to recognise the long term and broad value of research done properly, funded properly. And, you know, one of my two, I've got, I've got two observations that I make in, in those rooms. One of them is that, um, you know, if you think that it's expensive to fund research properly, 
property. Let's have a look at how expensive it is to not fund it properly because that's actually much worse in, in long-term and productivity terms. And the other, the other thing for people to remember um, around the cabinet table is the duration of a bachelor degree is shorter than the current forward estimates period. You know, we can actually, within the period of the budget that we are right now devising, we can start, educate and graduate people in fields that will help you in your portfolio. And that's why the rest of cabinet has to start viewing science and research and education patient portfolios as service portfolios for their needs because the Minister for Agriculture or the Minister for Emergency Responses or you know the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Resources, they can't actually do what their stakeholder groups need more efficiently and cost effectively than we can. We're actually already geared to do it. So investing in us is actually a cheap way for them to deliver for their portfolios. Which is a great way to wrap this. Uh, Professor Professor Colborn, Professor Jagadish, Dr Byron, thank you very much for your time. I hope we get a chance to do it again. And thank you to the audience. Um, this has been another gr great discussion, CMM and Twig Marketing. Thank you all very much, and we're out. <laughs>